What a reaction. A tongue. And when I taught college CT too, as soon as this came up, I was like, <laughs> I wasn't afraid of snakes, I guess. That's a green mamba. Deadly snake. Actually, I don't think it is. I think it's like a python or something, but it's a viper. There you go. Deadly. But the tongue is deadly after all. The tongue, our words, there is tremendous power in them. You'd have to admit. Um, we remember words. Words affect us profoundly. I remember when I was young, when I was, uh, after I did my first ever teaching at 12 years old, my dad afterward told me, Kyle, that was really good. I think you might be a gifted teacher. And to me, like, that set me on a course where I'm like, this is what I want to do. I want to keep teaching. Lo and behold, here I am today. And that's all he had to say, just those few words. But, you know, words have the power to lift up. They have the power to destroy, too. I also remember another thing when I was in junior high. I went to a Bible camp, and I was having a great time swimming in the pool there. Jumping off the diving board, pretending I was Sonic the Hedgehog and stuff. I don't know. I like. I have very my my memory of this is very crystal clear because of what happened. But I got out of the pool and I was walking, and uh, there was like a really cute gir girl there with her friend. And so I was like, oh, you know, hey. Well, as, as I was walking by, she just says to me, "Dude, you need a bra." <laughs> I was like, woo. I was kind of chubby back then. I mean, I guess maybe I'm kind of chubby now, but back then, you know, definitely more so. Uh, that really hurt. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Like, that was kind of devastating to junior high me. And uh, so much so that, like, I, I, I remember some things from that weekend, but that's the thing that really sticks out. Like, just that one moment. Ouch. Uh, that was horrible. Who knows what kind of effect that's had on me to this day. <laughs> the power of words. You know, James, it's all about putting our faith into action. That's his whole thesis, what we're, how the Christian is to live, how we're called to live, and how what we believe is reflected in our deeds. And certainly that's what Adam was hitting on last week, our deeds, our behavior as Christians, that, you know, you show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. That is that if you're a Christian— you know, that should be reflected in the way that you live your life. Like, this isn't an empty, powerless faith. You know, if we really put our trust in Jesus Christ, that should transform our lives, and it should reflect in our behavior. Well, it should also reflect in our words. And so James 3 now gets into the power of the tongue. He's already mentioned the tongue in previous chapters here, but here he really dives into it. And he, oh, let me plug this in. That's okay, because I'll do it now. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Oh, that's pretty crazy. Think about it. It's a sobering verse. I mean, certainly for me, I'm a teacher, you know, uh, that's heavy. But you know what? A lot of you are teachers too. You'd have to admit, we got several different fellowship groups, and I know each one of those fellowship groups have teaching rotations and many of you are in or have been in those teaching rotations. Maybe even most of you. I don't know. Maybe not most of you. I, I, I should take a poll. I should have taken a poll ahead of time. But you know what? We're a, a fellowship with a lot of teachers. On the one hand, it's really cool. On the other hand, yikes! We got a lot of people that are going to be judged very strictly. So, watch yourself. No, but, you know, when I think of teachers being judged... What the first person that came to my mind as I was studying this is this guy right here, Kenneth Copeland, you know, kind of wild guy. And I don't like normally like to just like bash and trash Christians, but I will say this, you know, like Kenneth Copeland, very popular. He's big name. I mean, his material and his stuff goes out across the entire world. And so he's very famous and his words are all over the place. And so I think it is appropriate for Christians to call out false teaching, especially when it's so public and widespread. And this guy, you know, there's no way to get around it. He's a false teacher. Um, he has some really strange and creepy doctrines that he's introduced. You know, he considers like faith, like a, a power, a force that you can control to shape the world around you. And it's, it's really odd. He kind of equates humans with God. And he says like, God is basically just a, a human 
you know, God the Father is. It's just like, it's really weird stuff he teaches. I saw a video where he was uh, symbolically drinking the blood of his friend, and his friend was symbolically drinking his blood. And it was like, almost like a satanic ritual. It was really bizarre and creepy and strange. Anyway, this guy's a, a teacher and a, you know, self-proclaimed prophet. His stuff's out there like crazy. And, you know, this is the kind of person who's going to be judged for that because he's using and abusing this teaching privilege to lead people astray and profiting off that too. I mean, this guy has like lots of private jets that he uses to fly himself to his many vacation homes. You know, it's really sick. And uh, certainly a verse like this would apply there where he needs to be you know, sober about this, that, uh, you know, you're more under the microscope in that case. You know, here's a, here's a question, though. What kind of teaching is he talking about? Because on the one hand, we're all called to teach, every single Christian, because Colossians uh, 3.16 talks about, let the word of Christ dwell with, within you richly, teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, right? So he's saying, teach one another. We're all supposed to teach one another. And so if we're all judged with greater strictness, then none of us are judged with greater strictness. There's just one judgment, right? Um, but I think he's talking about here, certainly those who are Bible teachers teaching from a position of some kind of authority. I think this would apply to our fellowship groups, that what he's getting at is there is a higher responsibility. You do need to be careful about what it is you're saying, what it is you're teaching, and you need to know the passage so that you're not going off into error. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, right? And, and throughout church history, it's, it's been like a, a lot of it, a tragedy, a tragedy of false teachers getting up and leading people astray, leading people into error, leading people into death, you know, and there is a greater strictness that's involved there. And so if we're going to teach the Bible, certainly in an authoritative way, that's something to take seriously. It's something to study up on and make sure that we're teaching accurately. And that's why, you know, when I and personally in our in my fellowship groups I've been in, I've always wanted to make sure our teaching rotations are with people who have that same kind of understanding that, you know, the Bible, we need to take the Bible seriously. And I usually want people that have some authority with the people in the group that are doing the work of ministry and that they are working on getting equipped and learning something. In other words, you know, teaching a fellowship group isn't just, oh, let's throw someone up there. This is a careful thing and someone who's going to take the Bible seriously and take their studies seriously. And we must know the Bible and accurately handle the Bible. As a side point, let me say this. You know, he's, he's getting at the point here that, that uh, you know, do your best rightly handling the word of truth. In other words, there's a correct way to understand the Bible and an incorrect way of studying the Bible. I remember a long time ago, uh, there were some girls that cornered me and John Hakes and said, uh, and saw we were carrying Bibles. And they're like, hey, you should do a Bible study with us. We're like, okay. And we sat down and, and she's like, let's open our Bibles. And she opened to something random. And she's like, okay, let's teach on this. And so she started talking about it. And she said, what this means to me is blah, 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 blah. And said, and it like wasn't dealing with the passage at all. And then the ne girl next to her is like, oh, well, what it means to me is, and like had a completely different meeting. And I was like, just sitting there going crazy. I'm like, ah! You're all, you're both wrong. Like there is a meaning to this. The Bible isn't something you just read to see like, what does it mean to me, right? And it's a mystical thing that could mean anything and interpret it in a million different ways. That's not the case at all. I mean, the, the authors of the Bible themselves, you know, say that uh, there's a right way to understand. There's a right way to interpret the Bible. And so, especially for those of us who are Bible teachers, like get the actual real meaning out of the text. It is possible. And in fact, we're commanded to do so. Um, but it should be helpful too. those of us who are just read the Bible. Like it means something objective. It's not just a subjective thing, you know, just for you and, your, and based on your feelings or something like that. So continuing on though, he's going to start to really illustrate and hammer home the power of our words. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So let's deal with this piece by piece. For we all stumble in many ways. Yes, true, right? I mean, <laughs> we all stumble in many ways. That's just a fact of life, something we have to trifle with. And, you know, I love this about the Bible, that uh, it's realistic, you know? We all stumble. We recognize that. And it's really at the heart of the gospel message 
Uh, we all stumble in many ways. Even Christians do. But nonetheless, what it just points to is our need for grace, for forgiveness from Christ. And that's really at the heart of the Christian message that uh, we all stumble, and yet we have the Lord Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life we weren't able to live and died on the cross to pay for our stumbles and our sins so that we could get close to God, so that we could know God and be forgiven by Him. And that's just the gospel message in a nutshell right there. So I just share that, you know, especially like if you're not a Christian, that if you'd get anything out of this teaching, that's the most important thing for you to get right there. That's the heart of the Christian message. You stumble, I stumble, we all stumble, but Jesus covers us. That's certainly his offer. And so will you receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and have your stumblings, your sins covered, or are you going to try to cover that yourself? Which, by the way, we've talked about in previous weeks is impossible. We all stumble in many ways, yes. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So there's something really important about controlling what you say, being in mastery of what you say. And you know, this is definitely a very, has been a very sobering teaching for me to study on, because this has certainly been a struggle that has come up and continues to come up sometimes in my own life, a loose tongue, talking when you shouldn't, saying the things you shouldn't, not speaking up when you should. I can attest to that fact. We all stumble in many ways. Oh yeah, me chief most perhaps. I don't know, but you know, it's a struggle. And so if anyone though, and he says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Well, does anyone like not stumble? in what they say all the time, right? Like, we all stumble many ways. It's almost like a hypothetical he's, he's presenting here. Like, if you're able to master your tongue, you're able to bridle your body too. In other words, spiritual maturity, growth, is very closely tied to the tongue, your words, what you say. And if you grow then in, in your ability to say and speak, you know, the things of God, you're going to grow and mature. That's really the key to unlocking spiritual maturity. So yeah, the key to maturity then is bridling the tongue. If you can control the tongue, the rest follows with it. I mean, we can attest to that. Like the most mature people that we know, certainly that I know, they have mastery of what they say to a degree, right? Like the, the mature people, it, it just seems like are able to say the right thing at the right time. Their words carry weight. You know, the people that I've looked up to the most in my own life, it's like, that's what it's, it's like. It's like being around them, what they say carries weight. It's like, it matters. And they just seem to know the right thing to say in the right time. And it's like, man, I've been seriously impacted by that in a positive way. That's what maturity looks like. You have mastery over your tongue. So, yeah, the way you talk, the way you speak, it, it's a demonstration of your maturity as a Christian. And so he continues on, he says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. And so he lists off several different uh, illustrations, talking about the power of t the tongue. Even though it's so small, it has such impact, right? The first is the idea of the bridle on a horse, which is like that little thing that's in his mouth. That little thing there can control the horse, a horse that's like half a ton. You know, it's insane. Little bit, it controls a horse. What direction? He brought up the rudder of a ship, right? And the ships they had back then, nothing compared to the ships we have now, but the principle is still true, Right. Massive car cargo ship, relatively small rudder that can control that whole thing. If something happens to that rudder, that ship is dead in the water, right? Such a small part of it is so key, so important to it. And so he's talking about the idea that the tongue is powerful. Though it may not seem so powerful, it is. Thus, we can't afford to be careless with it because it carries way more impact than we would think. Words can change the world. Words have changed the world. You know, example that pops in my mind is Winston Churchill. Like, he had a mastery of the English language. Uh, I was just talking to someone about the books that he wrote, which are masterful and amazing. 
but it was in World War II where he really shined, right? He was able to galvanize the British people in a powerful way because they were getting bombed by Nazi Germany, dropping bombs over London. The people were afraid, a lot of fear there. And so he was able to step up and lead courageously. And he used his words using the radio, you know, to galvanize the people. We shall fight in the beach. You know, I don't know the full quote here, but it was like, that's gone down in history, right? Just the words of Winston Churchill that, you know, in terms of the fervor and the attitude of the British people, it turned everything around completely. And they were able to, you know, sweep up Nazi Germany with the help of America, of course. But, you know, the power of words cannot be understated. On the other hand, you have this. Not a book recommendation, by the way, but a book that changed the world for the worse, right? Mein Kampf. It is estimated that for every word of Mein Kampf, 160 people died. Every, for every word of this book, right? He used words to change the world for the worse. The devastation, the death, the genocide, just from some words from this maniac. Yes, he continues on. He says, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Woo! Right? Really getting into the power of it. When I think of like fire, you know, like a small fire, like, like you don't need much to start a fire, right? It's like a spark, boom, it can, it can start a wildfire. Reminds you of this past summer. Remember this? The smog that covered all of North America. You know, I was reading up on this. Uh, these fires, they started in Canada. Thanks, Canada. But, but it was like basically thunderstorms that came through and lightning hits a tree there and, and uh, that starts a fire within the tree. And then when the, the rain dried up, that fire spread, and then boom, you have Canadian wildfires that like, and now uh, everyone in North America has to stay inside for a week because lightning struck a tree. You know, it's like, that's, that's insane when you really think about it in those terms, right? So small, such a small thing, and yet it impacted an entire hemisphere. <laughs> like, just wild. That's the nature of fire. It is powerful, and it has the power to destroy How does the tongue destroy? Well, how many marriages have ended because of the power of the tongue, because of the words that have been used carelessly to wound, to destroy? How many friendships have been uh, destroyed too by the words that we choose to use? The insults that are thrown, the gossip that's thrown around too, right? Children are particularly susceptible to our words. That's something I've certainly, you know, I'm learning as a father with two little girls. It's like, what you say really carries weight, more weight than you would expect, you know? And so it's not even like the words I say with them. It's even how I say them. Like I had, uh, uh, you know, uh, Diane come down and, you know, interrupt me uh, because she wanted to show me. I don't remember, but I was just like, you know, Diane, hang on just a minute. And I was like, you know, okay, I was in the middle of something. It's it's okay to, you know, say, let's do this later. But just how I said it, like her whole count, you know, okay, you know, goes upstairs. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, felt terrible. I had to go up immediately, (laughs) drop, I turned off everything I was doing, went upstairs, put her in my lap and just, you know, made her feel loved. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, Diane, what would you like? You know, let's play. But it was like, the words carry such weight you know, powerful. I think too, of uh, just social media. Like, you know, the people that are chronically online, there's just so many studies on this, that the more chronically online you are, the more apps you're on, the more you're engaged in the online, you know, sphere, the worse your mental health is. You know, what are you seeing? It's just words, basically, that people are throwing back and forth. And yet devastating, to devastating impact. People are dying, literally, because of it right? Words are powerful. Words can build up. Words can destroy. And so certainly he's getting the idea here that we, it's not something to be taken lightly. It's something to be very careful about. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about our words, especially in the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 26 says, like a madman who throws fireballs, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. <laughs> I've had this thrown at me a couple of times, unfortunately, uh, legitimately, <laughs> you know, but, uh, 
Yeah, it kind of gets the idea, like, especially it's, I mean, I've seen girls do it too, but you get a room full of, like, guys together, sometimes the right mood's there. It's like a bunch of fireballs getting thrown all over the place, you know what I mean? Cutting, nasty, guys trying to one-up one another with the insults, the name-calling. There's some nuance to this, right? Like, sometimes it's, like, in good fun, and we're trying to relate a little bit. You know, maybe you girls just don't get it, but sometimes this is what guys do, but... I'll tell you, I've been in situations where it's like, okay, you know, it's getting way overboard. And I've also contributed to that too, I will say. But, you know, where it's like just, uh, just nasty. And it just keeps going on and on and escalating. And then you leave the hangout, you're just like, let's not do that again. You know what I mean? Like, you've ever been like in a hangout like that? It's like, there's just nothing good going on here. Nothing good being said here. And so I think, you know, he's warning of that here where, you know, some people, that's just kind of the way that they relate, the way they talk. It's like a constant contest, you know, trying to one up, you know, other people and uh, throw people down. Some people are exceptionally good at it, by the way, because they're smart and and uh, cynical and they're very quick to see. You know, it really stinks to be that kind of person where you got you feel like you got to be careful with what you say around them because they might just use it against you and throw a barb. You know, what what happens there? Well, people begin to not trust you. They have their guard up around you, and it's like, well, I better be careful because this person's going to bust me if I say the wrong thing, right? Um, but, you know, that person is the madman that he's talking about here. It says in Proverbs 26, fire goes out without wood and quarrels disappear when gossip stops. The idea of gossip, yes, you know, that gossip contributes to quarrels. Gossip contributes to broken relationships. Um, and you know, I, guys gossip for sure, but this is kind of the other side of the coin. I, in my experience, it would seem gossip is more of a prevailing issue among women. And, uh, that was proven at the end of the college CT with how many women came up afterward to ask me about gossiping. It was very fascinating and cool. We had great conversations, but yeah, women especially like to gossip for sure. Why do we gossip? Well, I suppose it's kind of that jolt, right? It's exciting to get the the goods on someone else. It makes you feel a little bit better too, because it's like, <laughs> hear what this person did? I would never do that, you know? Um, there's It's a power thing too, that uh, you have power over a person when you get the goods on them too. Um, but it's not good. Gossip uh, destroys people. And I'll tell you too, I had a lot of questions in college about what constitutes gossip, because it was like, you know, well, Oftentimes I'll talk to someone before I talk to the person that I see an issue with, right? And is that gossip because I didn't go to them first? And you know, basically what I said is it's a it's a judgment call there. But nine times out of the ten out of ten, if you didn't start by talking to this person about an issue you saw, that ain't the way to do it, right? You got to start with that person. You know, you just have to imagine how would you feel if someone you trusted and you loved started, I saw an issue with you and their immediate reaction every time was always to go to someone else first, you know, and then they may or may not come to you, right? You would feel terrible. And so it's kind of like part of the judgment call here is putting yourself, you know, in the other person's shoes. How would they feel if I was talking about that issue? If, would they be comfortable with that? Um, and so that's a basic guide, you know, on gossip. And gossip is, is especially risky, in a something like a fellowship in a church. Why? Because it's kind of like a family. I mean, we have we, we are a family, we're a spiritual family. Uh, but people get close and they get to know each other, and you get to know each other's you know positive things and the negative side too. And so there's danger there. there there's beauty to that, and that there's real relationships happening. But uh, there's danger to that too, and it becomes very easy to gossip with people. And so. This is a privilege. This is something we need to be able to wield very carefully and thoughtfully that we don't, you know, uh, become a, a church of gossips because it's a danger and it's present out there. There are churches where, you know, that, that's what they do. And I've seen gossip. I've seen it happen. I've done it too. I mean, I, I suppose we've all been there before. But as we mature, as we grow, this is, should be something that we're paying more mind to that uh, we let the Lord shine the light on in our lives. Then Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up a anger. This is really getting to even just how we say words, right? That, uh, you know, you see an issue, you want to help, but, you know, there's a way of dealing with it that is effective and ineffective. The harsh word, right? What this tends to do is stir up anger. It raises the temperature. But as a person of peace, 
following God, like we're charged with bringing the temperature down, right? Bringing peace to the situation. And so we got to be careful about how we approach one another. It's not just, oh, I said the right thing. And so I'm in the right. Like, okay, but why don't we consider how we say it too, right? Um, we want to be wise about this. Words can start fights or they can put them out. And I'll say, you know, oftentimes people want to give themselves leave to just like vomit out there, right? And I certainly see that on social media all the time. It's like just people vomiting out, like just not being careful about what they're saying, but just I feel a certain way, so, you know, just out there like, oh, yuck. And it's like, man, just the way people talk to each other, I don't know, maybe it just seems more common these days with the online world, you know, being there, but it seems to be getting worse, in my opinion. Just the fights, the divisions that are out there, people cannot get along, and people are just not being considerate, right, about what they're saying. It's like, I feel a certain way, so I have a right to say it how I want to say it. And it's like, you know what, technically true. We got the, the First Amendment, right? Uh, we can say, you know, what we want. We have freedom to, of speech right? But just because you have a freedom for something doesn't mean we should wield that however we want, right? For a Christian, we have different considerations. We're considering how we're honoring God. We're considering how to love, right? And so sometimes that means that we're going to restrain ourselves out of love, out of consideration for another person, even though I know if I wanted to, I could put you on blast, but I'm not going to do that for your sake, right? Anyway, we're called to live differently as Christians. It says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. You know, that is a kind of a remarkable fact, right? In terms of taming things. Like, we do have mastery over the animals. There is no doubt about that. Like, every day, like, a new animal species goes extinct, and it's like nothing. You know what I mean? Like... If we, if we wanted to, like, just, gorillas are terrible. We need to eliminate all the gorillas. We could, like, do that today. You know what I mean? Like, humanity has the power over the animals. They can tame any animal. They can destroy any animal. But the tongue, it's nothing compared to the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. You know, we think nothing of it. And yet the tongue is the source of so many of our wounds and our hurts it's insane. I mean, I know many of you carry scars, carry wounds just from what people have said to you in your life, you know? Like just just words can carry, it has that kind of effect that it even matches, you know, physical things you go through at the same time. It's just amazing. And so it's powerful. It's powerful. It's destructive. We're not called to speak that way as Christians. So continuing, he says, with it, being the tongue, we bless our Father, or we, bl we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God, right? So this is kind of like God's perspective on people. This is part of why people are just so loose in how they destroy and cut down people. It's like they just don't value people the way God does. But God sees everyone uh, as having inherent value because we're all made in the image of God. That's God's perspective. We're called to put on that same perspective. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. He's pointing out the inconsistency because he says, look, like you're Christians, right? We bless the Lord our Father. Right? That's, that's certainly what we're called to. And yet, from the same mouth that blesses God can come cursing of other people. And, and this is a real problem because you're not made to be that way. You're not made to speak that way. And the struggle with us is living inconsistency, inconsistently. And so this is why the key to taming the tongue involves an understanding of our identity in Christ. It's an issue of identity. We have to understand, first and foremost, the Christian has been made anew. If you've received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you've been made anew. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. There's a fundamental identity change that happens at the moment of conversion when you receive Christ. 
And so that means we're called to reflect that in the way we live. We're called to live differently and speak differently because we're a new creation. Ephesians 4.21 says, Assuming you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth in Jesus, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We're called to put on the new self. And he's giving here the key to change, to experiencing change. The key to consistency in the way we talk and the way we behave as Christians is returning to the source, our new identity in Christ. So that means, okay, you got a, a tongue problem. You got to be even a behavior problem, whatever. It's not a matter of trying harder and cleaning up your act yourself by your power. That's impossible. It's a matter of returning to who you already are as a Christian, your new identity. God has made you new. He's done all the heavy lifting. And so when we act out, when we're living inconsistently, it's because there's a disconnect. We've been made anew, but we forget that. And we start living and thinking like our old selves. And so the key to release here is just simply remembering that you've been made anew, returning to the Lord, the source of that new identity, letting Him minister to you, letting Him teach you. He will ter- transform you from the inside out because you can't affect that change yourself. That's, that's a work that only Christ can do, and you have to let Him do that. And so a person who is a Christian has their identity changed and is connected with the Lord, right? Being ministered to by the Lord, they're going to experience change. And so, yeah, it starts by connecting with the Lord. It starts by first becoming a Christian, having a new identity, and then understanding that identity, understanding God, connecting back with Him. And so this this is what it looks like practically then for Christians. How does God affect this change from the inside out? Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And so he's giving us a new perspective on language, right? You're you're a new creation, okay? And so what are we to focus on, right? The focus is love. It's love, right? He's saying, talk uh, 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 that which is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace, right? It has a big consideration for other people. It's a focus on love. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Well, one of the questions that comes up naturally here is, uh, is this like cussing? Is he talking about cussing, corrupting talk? Does that count as cussing? Well, uh, yes and no, I guess is my answer to that. Yes and no. You know, I I will say, uh, you know, uh, we had a poker night not that long ago. And, uh, you know, I was like, there was a big pot, uh, you know, in there. And me and the, the other college guy were in it. And uh, I had him beat. I had like 90% odds in this pot. And then he flipped the ace on the river, which is, you know, horrendous. I mean, you know, he's a poker player. He knows that's devastating. You guys who don't play poker, you don't know. But, uh, you know, when that happened and I lost all that pot that I should have won, I might have called him a word. That is not an impure word. It may have just come out of my mouth, right? Now, was that a sin? I say it could have been really depends on how he takes you. It depends on what's fitting for the occasion. In that case, he thought it was hilarious, you know? And he was like, yeah, absolutely, and brought it in. And I will say, too, I said that, but it wasn't out of true, pure hatred and anger. It was out of, uh, it was fun. It was fun. The whole room was howling, you know, because it was like everyone was gathered around this table. It was kind of crazy. It was fun. It was exciting. Was that said, no, I, like, was contributing to the night. Young college students, they had heard this word before, right? But (laughs) I have also heard cuss words used in some pretty bad circumstances, too. And I'll tell you, there is a power to cuss words that is, uh, there's a spice to them. You know what I mean? And uh, there's many, perhaps many more uh, uh, occasions where it is not fitting to throw that out there. And I'll say, like, I've 
I had to talk to a guy who, you know, in the during CTs, people were sitting down, like was just letting F bomb after F bomb drop very loudly. And I was like, my brother in Christ, could, <laughs> could we chill, please? <laughs> And, uh, you know, Jen, and he was totally, I was like, yeah, okay, sorry. Because, because this is a, consi- it's a consideration thing. It's a hospitality issue at that point, right? Like we want families to come in. We want people to bring their kids. And it's like, uh, people are not going to want to hear very loud, you know, that being uttered very loudly, especially in front of their kids. And so for, in consideration of others, we really do not want to be just so loose and careless about it. I'll also say, you know, people that are just like every other word is a cuss word. You just kind of sound ignorant. So, you know, it could be an occasion where is that how you want to portray yourself? Uh, I don't know. But, you know, cuss words, I've heard cuss words being used in loving ways. I'll just say it kind of sounds weird. But one time someone told you, told me, I effing love you, bro. And I'll tell you what, I felt really loved. <laughs> you know, I don't think that was a sin in that case. But it is something to be careful about, something to think about. You know, I've, I've been in rooms where it's just fine. It's like just dirtying the room up. Like you can tell like this is not fitting for the occasion. What's the thing to consider is what is loving? What is loving? What is not loving? That's really the prime metric that we're using to measure our words. Um, you know, are we using our words to tear down, to corrupt, or are we using it to bless? And I'll just tell you what, I, I've, I've definitely been in rooms before, and unfortunately, certainly in the past, have contributed to, like, not even cuss words, right? But, like, you don't have to cuss. You can just use talk that is really degrading. You know what I mean? That is just, especially sometimes, uh, in a young, I used to work at a restaurant, and a lot of those guys, you get together, and they start talking, especially about women, and the, the way they talk is just horrific. It's disgusting, you know? And Christians really should not be talking about our fellow sisters that way. I mean, should we talk about our fellow brothers that way, right? That is corrupting talk. It is not healthy. It's not loving. It's just not loving. And so it's like, how would they feel if they knew you were talking about them in that way, right? Like we we, we do want to be careful about the way we speak. And it's, you know, consider Colossians 4, 6. He says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. The way we talk, it's supposed to be gracious, seasoned with salt, right? It's like we're being measured about it. We're being considerate about it so that you may know how to answer each person. Um, Again, it's a focus on love, right? We want to be in a position where we can offer the answer that person really needs, you know? And so instead of just showing up to a social situation and letting the tongue fly, you know, just because it's fun and blah, 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 you know, it's more about like, is there something I can contribute here uh, that is helpful, that is loving, that is good? And so that's why, like, too, it also applies to those, like, uh, there's some people that are just really quiet and hardly ever quiet and really hardly ever contribute. And there's wisdom to that. You know, we should be quick to listen, slow to speak. That really helps you be able to know how to answer each person. But on the other hand, it's like sometimes there's opportunities to contribute, offer a word of encouragement, something, and you're shrinking back from that. Like, say something, contribute something helpful when the, op- the opportunity is there in front of you. Don't shrink back. Um, we are called to answer. We are called to answer people too, you know? Uh, but it's a focus on love. He says in Luke 6, 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Getting to the idea of it's what, what's inside, you know, results in what comes out. What comes out is, is a result of what's inside of us. Jeremiah 79 says the heart is uh, uh, deceitful and desperately sick. Who can understand it? That's kind of just the human heart naturally. And it should be no surprise that uh, when everyone in social media today has a soapbox, you know, so much of what's uttered and said out there is just nonsense and tearing down and, you know, uh, not helpful at all. It's because the human heart is sick. And so you give, a, you know, a sick person a soapbox, sickness is going to come out of it. And so we have to be aware of that, that, you know, if you're a Christian, you've had your heart transformed, and yet we can feed ourselves on things that are unhelpful, that are sickly. What goes in comes out. And so someone who's full of the Spirit, that is going to the Lord in prayer, uh, being ministered to by God and His Word, you know, coming to to, uh, fellowship and contributing, like, you know what? The way that they talk is going to change. Why? Their heart is changing. And so what's coming out is really helpful, sweet, amazing things. But someone who is in the flesh, that is, you know, kind of just investing in things selfishly, 
in their own lives, doing their own thing, invested in sin, whatever it is, you're just in a mode where it's like selfish, just me all the time. You know, what's going to come out is garbage, garbage in, garbage out. And so sometimes you can kind of tell like someone who's just their relationship with the Lord is disconnected there because the way they're talking is like, hmm, that's not right. Like, that's not good. What's going on here? What goes in comes out. What's in the heart comes out. And so there is a question here. What is it that you're consuming? Because that will be reflected in your speech too. In the end here, it's really two directions of the tongue, a poisonous route or a fruitful route. Which one will we take, right? Poison. The poisonous route, it's the language of hate and anger. The fruitful route, it's the language of love, refreshment, peace, building up. And so for Christians, we're really called to live counterculturally. Again, you know, one way you can put it is in the culture out there now, it's just a lot of toxicity, a lot of toxicity all over the place. Cruelty abounds. You know, like these are the tweets or the X posts. I don't, is that what, X files, X posts. I don't remember what they're called now, but uh, Facebook posts, Instagram, whatever, like the ones that get the most clicks and shares are like oftentimes the most inflammatory things because people are engaging with it. And so if a post has a lot of comments on it, it tends to rise up in people's feeds. And so you want to get, post something that's going to make a lot of people very angry, right? That's kind of the idea. So yeah, toxicity abounds, whatever is the most viral and gets the clicks. And so that's having an effect on people, you know, it's encouraging toxicity and, and, and it's, it's, it's having a horrendous effect you know, people are being abused. People are wielding their words in cruel ways. People are being scarred by that. And so we're called to live differently, not just in our conduct, but in the way we speak, the words that we choose to speak, right? Those of us with social media accounts, we should definitely be more considerate about what it is we post, right? Like we shouldn't sound like everyone else. We should sound differently. Um, you know, I I've noticed that too at my restaurant job. You know, these guys just be talking you know, horrendous thing in the break room, you know, just the most disgusting things. And they would want me to join along, you know? And so when I wasn't comfortable doing that, they made fun of me and they, you know, it made my life harder because of that. But, you know, the result was they, there was kind of a respect there that actually they knew that I wasn't going to be the one to gossip about them because I'm not in the circle gossiping right there with them, you know, here. Because they know, like, if you're joining in on the gossip, they know, oh, you're going to leave. <laughs> like, if you're gossiping about this person, you'll gossip about me too. They know that implicitly, right? Even if they may not say that. Um, and, and, you know, there's a difference between me and those guys. And actually, I found that uh, many of them found that compelling. A lot of the time, they want you to join in in that talk just because it makes them feel better about themselves. But when you can actually live as a shining light, you know, uh, the city set up on the hill, that is, there's something different about you and you're not speaking like them, there's something refreshing about you. They may make fun of you in the moment, but that'll stick with them. They'll notice there's something actually refreshing about this person. This is someone I can trust. Unlike these other guys I'm joking around with right now, this is a person that I can trust because they're not like these other guys or these other girls, right? People are watching and they notice this. We need to live differently. Uh, I also mentioned too, the spiritual gifts right? We've talked about that every Christian is given at least one spiritual gift. It's remarkable how many of these spiritual gifts just have to do with the tongue, with our words, right? Prophecy, teaching, preaching, uh, encouragement, you know, many more. It's like a, a lot of them have to do with the power of the tongue and our words. And so it's important. Um, yes, we need to be using our words to build one another up. Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, right? It's a focus on love, a focus on building up. And, um, you know, again, this is the metric we use to decide how, it, how do I speak? What is it I need to say, right? It's what is loving? What does this person need to hear? Uh, and a fellowship like that is a, is a, is a beautiful, fel it's a, like a spring of water, refreshing spring, to people, you know. Let me end just with some proverbs here that I think are particularly powerful. The words of the godly are like sterling silver. The heart of a fool is worthless, right? That they're like good words, encouraging words, valuable, fool, worthless. You just got nothing to contribute, you know? And so you become someone who's insignificant. It says, the words of the godly encourage many, 
but fools are destroyed by their lack of common sense. You know, um, actually, let me read the next one first. Everyone enjoys a fitting reply. It is wonderful to say the right thing at the right time. You know, there is something really cool about that. When you're connected to the Lord, letting him change you, like you just start to be the kind of person that says the things exactly what that person needed to hear. And it was like, thanks, God. God put that on, you know. Uh, I was really uh, impacted by uh, at my dad's funeral, actually, because like here we were there and just so many people attested to and had to say just how Keith encouraged them, built them up. He was a guy who knew how to use his words powerfully. Um, sometimes a negative. Oh yeah, for sure. But I'll tell you what, his legacy was a legacy of power. It was a legacy of love. It was a legacy where so many people attested the fact that he used his words to encourage. And that was, you know, basically what it was like, you know, you go and hang out with Keith, like you knew he was going to say something that was going to be important, you know, and that, uh, that you needed to hear. And he just had that way about him where it's like, yeah, he, he was that kind of guy. He was sensitive to God. And he cared about people. He loved people. And so he used his words uh, quite often to build up. And just the, how many people that were there and how many people attested that fact is a reflection of that. He left a powerful legacy. But so many people don't leave a powerful legacy, right? They're not using their words to impact the people around them. And uh, I've been to funerals before where that's a really obvious. You know, not very many people there. And when people get up, what they have to say about the person, <laughs> it's just like, oh, that's kind of pathetic. You know, and it's like, well, that's because this person was just kind of a, a jerk, you know, in his life. And he didn't really have much to say, you know, besides, I don't know, when something happened with the sports team or something. It's like, it's sad. We are called to make an impact on the people around us. You're going to make an impact. It's just, are you going to be a positive presence, presence or a negative presence? Are you ready to be that kind of person that will impact your friends, your family positively? Uh, 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 not shrinking back from the opportunity to, uh, to speak into their lives. Um, anyway, yeah, you can read there. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, healthy f- for the body. Yes, tasty. It's beautiful. You know, notice that. It's like a guy just hanging out, riffing. But then someone has something really encouraging to say. It's like, oh, wow. It's like the whole air in the room just changed, you know. Timely advice is lovely, like golden apples in a silver basket, right? Good words does, is not just encouraging. It's giving good advice too. Like you see, so you can help. Why not help if you can? Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Yeah. People are scarred by horrendous things people say. Relationships are destroyed, but words of love can heal that, right? So anyway, I'm just going to go ahead and pray here and uh, we'll get to your comments and questions. But uh, Lord, we just want to thank you first and foremost, you know, that you died on the cross for us, because as you say, we stumble in many ways, and, uh, you know, I can certainly attest to that fact, Lord. Um, I know certainly in the in the realm of the tongue, that's been uh, something that's bitten me uh, several times in my life, but just seeing, uh, you know, how you've been, uh, you know, bringing this to my heart and have brought this to my heart, my life has been incredible. Uh, certainly in a strong way through my little girls, something about having little daughters that <laughs> makes you more considerate there, Lord. And it's a blessing, but I just pray Lord that this fellowship could be, could leave a, a, a lasting legacy, a spiritual legacy, a legacy of building up instead of tearing down Lord. It is just like a toxic soup out there in the world. Just people are so eager to jump on the bandwagon of uh, tearing others down and uh, cutting each other down. It's just a horrendous thing. So many people, um, you know, just are, 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 you know, struggling their mental health, suicides, I mean, everything, just through words, through what people say. And it's refreshing, you know, coming into your body, hear your body of Christ, coming to your word, being refreshed by your words, because your words do bring healing. Uh, your words change the world for the better. And so I just pray that, uh, you know, this healing that uh, you've done in our hearts as Christians would be reflected in our speech as well as one another. May we find opportunities to encourage, may we find opportunities to build up, and, uh, you know, may our times of fellowship together be worthwhile and refreshing. Praise things in your name. Amen.